Good, good morning, everybody. How are we on this beautiful Sunday? You know, I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it's very convenient that Mike had minor surgery the first Sunday after the election. And he said, you know what, I'm just going to give it to the new guy and just let him deal with all that. Um, no, I was laughing with Mike. I was like, you timed this pretty well, man. Um, but I am so glad to be with you guys today. And it is uh, always an honor to see folks up here. I live in Wilmington, so I got the opportunity to come up and spend some time with you guys. And uh, it's a blessing to me. So before we dive in, I do want to have a prayer and set our hearts right. And then we'll dive into the word, okay? Father God, we bless your name and thank you for the opportunity to gather and learn from your spirit and to be taught by you through your word. Father, I thank you for the hunger in the hearts of those that would be here today, uh, that would come, and I pray that they would not come to your table and leave empty, that there would be something that they could feast on today that would nourish their soul deeply and that would remind them of your great love for them. Father, we thank you for this gathering and this facility to be able to gather, and I just pray that your spirit would be present uh, as we walk through your word today, learning about your kingdom and our purpose in it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. Um, so this topic of purpose, it's interesting. Mike and, and I had the opportunity to preach um, for Mike probably a year ago, I guess, when we were at uh, Ray's, um, if, if any of you may recognize me from that. And it's amazing to see how you guys are growing and what God's doing, and that's super encouraging. And so when Mike said, can you fill in for me, I said, I'd love to. What are we talking about? He said, we're talking about purpose. And I was like, okay, well, that's definitely something that I'm passionate about and look forward to speaking about. And it was wild because the next morning or something, I was at the coffee pot, and I was kind of like, Lord, where are we going here? What are we going to speak about when I go up to... to to carry, and it felt like an immediate download in my spirit. And I, I, was, I was having this conversation in my spirit with the Lord about what we were going to talk about today, and he just said, the pearl of great price. And it was like immediately I had the whole sermon just kind of like at least the direction of it laid out in my head. And so I'm going to do my best to try to kind of harness all of this in into some tangible topics that you guys can, can dive into. Um, to give you guys a little bit of backstory for me, and I'll share more of my testimony in a bit, but I'm the CEO of um, an independent insurance agency in my hometown of Wilmington. Um, I also am the executive director of a nonprofit. I have a big, big, big part and passion on helping people bridge the space between business and their faith. And to that end, we, we facilitate and run a thing called Faith in Business in Wilmington and here in Raleigh. I've done that for the last five years um, in a various uh, capacity with ministry. I've done a lot of business coaching, a lot of consulting. I've given a TEDx talk. So I have a lot of experience in this realm of helping people talk through, uncover, and understand their purpose. And so I'm bringing all of that to the table today and just going to kind of throw everything out there. And hopefully the Lord will do something um, really, really cool with it. But that being said, let's dive right into the text and jump into this idea of the pearl of great price. So this can be found in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to start in verse 44 and then go through um, to the end here. So just contextually, Jesus, this is fairly early in ministry, he's setting up um, this, this concept of parables. He's just given the parable of the seed, the parable of the sower, and now he jumps into um, this understanding of what the kingdom of God is. Because if you can imagine, this guy starts coming around, he starts talking about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. What does that actually mean? And so now he starts tearing, telling parables about what this actually is. So in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, a little side note at the end of this chapter, this is not on the screen here, but at the end of this chapter is the famous passage 
where basically everybody goes, who the heck is this guy teaching about the kingdom? Is this not the carpenter's son? And it says they took offense at him, and he did not do mighty works in his hometown because of his unbelief. And I'm tying all that together because it goes into this context of what we're going to be diving into today with, with purpose. Okay, So the pearl of great price. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So the ingredients for a pearl. All right. Now, I am uh, a Wilmingtonian, born and raised down there. This time of year, I get fired up because somebody's going to be roasting some oysters. Right? We're going to have some oysters. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Somebody is going to be roasting some oysters, right? And so, are y'all oyster fans? Are you any oyster fans? You either love them or you hate them. Okay, so a few people. So, the, the, the reality of a pearl, when he's talking about the pearl of great price, what is the pearl? Well, the pearl is nothing more than a combination of three things. Pain, patience, and God's design. Okay? You see, a pearl would never be born if it were not for an oyster experiencing some discomfort. You see, what happens is, is these oysters get this small grain of sand lodged within its shell, and it's making them so frustrated, and it's disturbing their environment so much that they begin to secrete this fluid that God put in them to cover up this painful place. And they do it over and over and over again until it becomes this beautiful fruit of frustration. You see, a pearl is nothing more than the fruit of an oyster's frustration. And it takes that pain plus the patience and the time of God's design to coat that area of pain to allow this beautiful pearl to be born, essentially, to come to life. And so Jesus, when he's teaching about the kingdom of God, you know, it's not this ideology that, listen, if you come follow Jesus, everything's going to be easy and good. Cupcakes and rainbows. In fact, he's saying the kingdom of God has a lot to do with this idea of what a pearl is. There's going to be some pain. And there's going to be some patience required. But on the back end, you're going to get something beautiful that only God can take credit for. You see, the beautiful thing is the kingdom of God is not something that you and I can build. It's something God is building, and he invites us to participate in it. You see, I think a lot of times in our Christian life, we always ask ourselves, what do I need to do to build God's kingdom? Instead, it's a different ideology. God's actually building it through you if you learn to let him do that. You see, we live in a culture that likes to check the boxes on the things that we've done in order to kind of position ourselves within the kingdom if we're doing God's work or not. And ultimately, the only work we're required to do is to surrender. So if we'll go to this first point here. So, you know, our culture is adverse to pain. We avoid pain at all costs. In fact, if you turn on a television or if you look on your real feed, every single advertisement that is coming your way is trying to sell you something because of a pain point that you have. And so our culture is conditioned to avoid pain. And what we do to avoid pain is a variety of different things, right? But we can, we can try to avoid pain by creating these environments where, you know, we, we try to go in excess, right? We buy certain cars, we buy houses or rental properties, or we do all these different things. In reality, we're trying to cover up this pain of insufficiency, so we're trying to put up this facade like things are going really well. 
Or you see, we have this pain in our life because of a health situation. And in reality, what God's asking us to do is to get healthy and change some lifestyle habits when in reality, we just want to begin to medicate. Nothing against medication. My point is, we are a culture who has been conditioned to seek the path of least resistance, and we're missing the pearl. If we're a culture that avoids pain, we're going to avoid the pearl. And what we have to learn is that God is a God who knows what pain is like. And he wants to meet us in that pain and invite us into this patience so that he can produce something spectacular. I'm reminded right now of a quote from C.S. Lewis. And it says something along the lines, I can't remember if it's mere Christianity, but I think it might be one of his other um, writings. But he says, we are far too easily pleased. We settle for mud pies in the slums when God has prepared for us a house by the sea. You see, if we wake up every day or if we live our lives trying to avoid pain, my point is this, we are going to miss the pearl. Next point. And, and the reality is we, 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 we've become conditioned with an instantaneous culture, right? Right? We want instant results. You know, I've got my phone here. It's easy. I've got a five-year-old. I've got five kids, by the way, and, um, and they're fantastic. My, my beautiful wife actually got to join me today, so they're with their grandparents, and this is a special morning. I can promise you that. <laughs> um, and so we, um, we've got five, you know, beautiful kids or whatever, but my, my youngest daughter, Emmy, is precious, and Mary Elizabeth is, is her given name. We call her Emmy, and Emmy um, is still learning how to speak, um, and she has a, a bit of a lisp, and, and she'll wake up in the morning, and she will say, Siri, what's the weather today? Or, or uh, Alexa, what's the weather today, right? And I'm like, my five-year-old daughter, is getting an immediate weather report from a device in our house that is connected to the internet and it tells her what the weather is going to be like. Used to, you'd have to call your grandma to find out what the weather's going to be like because grandmas always know, you know, oh, it's supposed to rain on Thursday, right? Um, but my point is, we live in this instantaneous culture. Like, like think about it. It, it, was a, it was a point where a number of years ago when I was writing my book, people used to read blog posts. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody reading blog posts no more. What are we doing? We're watching reels. We're watching shorts. We watch, don't act like y'all don't watch TikTok. Come on now. Everybody, I mean, this is what we've done. We've become conditioned to receive our information in small, bite-sized segments because we want instant solutions. Woo, thank you, Jesus. We want instant solutions for eternal issues. Come on. We want instant solutions for eternal issues. We're sitting here wondering, what's my purpose, as if some five-step book is going to give it to us. What we have to realize, and what I'm setting up here, I feel like I'm preaching. I guess I am preaching today, but I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm kind of with you, you know what I mean? I want to get down and, and look at you in the face. I'm not coming down on you. I'm saying, this is the journey that I had to go through as a young father, businessman in the church, trying to figure out how to posture myself, position myself, how to, you know, kind of go after it or whatever. But then I realized the world that I lived in wanted to make me adverse to pain and give me instant solutions, and that meant that I was going to miss God's purpose. If you're looking for a lack of pain, and if you're looking for instant solutions, you will not understand the kingdom of God. Period. Period. So, what do we do about it? I'm going to jump in. This is James 5. More scripture is always good. I'm going to read this 5, starting in verse 7, and I'll kind of read through. 
Be patient, therefore, brothers, until, hold on to that word, the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the, uh, for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it rece- receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of the suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is like five verses and you've got patient, 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 steadfast, steadfast. I think James is trying to hit something for us here. But what's interesting about this is when, it, when he follows up, be patient, therefore, that word, until. And he, and he says it later, until. You see, the problem with our culture, and you can click over the next point, the problem with our culture is it makes us think that there is nothing on the other side of our waiting. There's nothing on the other side of our patience. But the word until means there is an expiration for your pain in the kingdom of God. That your pain that you're experiencing when you were in God's kingdom has an expiration date. But we are so conditioned because we don't like the unknown. It's like, God, how long am I going to have to go through this? How long am I going to have to suffer? How long am I going to have to struggle? And my friends, what the Lord has spoken to me over my life is as long as it takes. As long as it takes to get us to recognize it's not our kingdom. I would say we are so conditioned to think it's our kingdom. And as a result, we want to align things in our kingdom as if it were God's will. So when things don't go our way, we get frustrated. Because we forget that it's not our kingdom. And you can apply this to anything that we go through as a culture. Because what I would say is the culture around me that I see is more of a heightened state than it's ever been about things not going the way that we think they should go. When in reality, our job is to yield and surrender and submit to God who is in charge of his own kingdom. So when you start asking yourself, I, I would say, what's irritating your oyster? What's irritating your oyster? What's that thing that just won't leave you alone? What's that thing that is constantly nagging you? What is that thing in your life that's bothering you? That's the thing that God wants to use to bring a blessing. But he can't do it unless you allow him to cover it and coat it and meet you in the midst of it, and I wrote it this way. You see, we are a people who want the pearl without the pain. We are a people who want the destination without the discipline. We are a people who want the promotion without the preparation. We are a people who want purpose without the process. That was a lot of alliteration. Sorry about that. Hopefully it made sense. We are a people who want purpose without the process. So you're saying, okay, Matt, I hear you talking about kingdom. I hear you talking about pain, all this kind of stuff. What does this have to do with purpose? And I would tell you that the ingredients for a pearl are the exact same ingredients for purpose. It's amazing. God In his infinite glory and wisdom, when he made you, he didn't make a mistake. 
It says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, formed in our mother's wombs. And he knows the plans beforehand that we might step into them. This is this Bible, right? So either we believe this about our God or we have resolved it to some motivational liturgy. You see, the problem is, is we have this, this culture that's conditioned us to, to, to receive these ideologies, right? If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. God helps those who help themselves, right? And we go, oh, yeah, 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 it ain't the word. It's not the word of God. And so when we hear this idea that you were fearfully and wonderfully made, we shelf it onto, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Instead of actually diving into the reality of what does it mean that the God of the universe who spoke everything into existence literally knew you before you were formed. And he didn't make a mistake when he made you. And he knows the exact amount of pain you're going to have to go through in order that your purpose might be birthed out. It's funny, my wife and I got time in the car. I had to facilitate a wedding in uh, Newburn yesterday, so we had two hours up there. Last night, two hours here. And in the car, we, we kind of engaged in this neat little thing. It was kind of like a know your spouse kind of thing. It was like a... Um, have deep conversations or whatever, it, it, it popped up somewhere, and I was like, well, let's just do this. This will be fun. And one of the questions was, what is the most memorable time that you and I have spent together? And without hesitation, my first response was when our kids were born. Now, interestingly enough, we have five kids and four pregnancies. Y'all do that math. That means twins were there somehow, some way. It, it's funny, my wife and I went on a trip. I won a trip for... Uh, our company with Farm Bureau to Hawaii, and so I always joke we should name my, my sons Maui and Wowie. <laughs> she didn't go for that. Their names are Grayson and Wyatt. <clears throat> so, but anyway, you, you've, got, you've got this pregnancy thing. We were talking about this in the car. My point is, I don't know how many of you have been in the delivery room Bless you if you had. It's a special, beautiful place, but it is not for the faint of heart. I fainted the first time, true story, and was laying on the ground, and they started, like, resuscitating me with orange juice, right? As, as my wife's given birth, it was, a, it was a comical moment. But my point is the beauty of pain producing and bringing something to life is never more apparent to us than when we have children, Why should our purpose in the kingdom be any different? I'm hesitant to use this word because it's a trigger word, but I feel convicted to say it. And, I, and again, this is from my heart. A lot of times with people's purpose, they abort it before it can ever take root in their heart. And I say that as someone who has walked through countless hours with people who have given up on their purpose because it just was too hard. I have no implication on the other side of what I'm, what I'm saying is about purpose specifically. People give up far too easily on God's purpose in their life because they're not conditioned to deal with the pain. But the promise of the kingdom is it's only that pain that can birth something miraculous. Let's go to Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5, 8. I'm going to start in 7 before that. In the days of his flesh, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, King Jesus, offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a man, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Jesus learned obedience because he was willing to suffer. If Jesus learned obedience through suffering, why do you and I get a hall pass? 
Why would we get a hall pass on suffering? You see, the, the ultimate fruit of suffering in the kingdom of God is obedience. When we embrace the word of God for what it is, and we understand that the only way he can birth out obedience in our lives is that we might suffer and learn to yield. We might be willing to embrace the pain and allow his design to begin to cover that up so that he can bring something to life that is beautiful. You know, I, like I said, I get to walk with a ton of people who, who have these dreams, these visions, these ideas of things they felt like God's called them to do. And, and what they end up doing is they go, well, I can't do that because it doesn't make money. I can't do that because I don't have money. I can't do that because my parents don't believe it's going to work. I can't do that because it's too risky. When you get into the word of God, tell me a place where God teaches us to, you to tell him the things you can't do. If you understand the word of God, the relationship with God is not about telling him the things that can't be done. He is a God of the impossible. And we either believe that or we don't. And we invite that presence into our lives or we don't. One of the things that is painfully apparent to me is a large portion of our population that are doing things that they despise. They're working in jobs that they're unhappy in. They're in relationships that feel unfulfilled. And they're longing and searching for purpose. But they're also imprisoned to this ideology of provision. When you read the word, God tells us one of his names is Jehovah Jireh. Does anybody know what that translation means? God will provide. Thank you. He is the provider. So at some point in time, we have to either look in the mirror and say, this is my kingdom on the, my back, or it's your kingdom that I get to participate in. And we have to have these reconciliation moments. Now, what I can tell you is, as a person who has, has given the last number of years of his life to living out this purpose, let me give you a, a quick testimony and an example here. So, um, you know, five kids and beautiful kids, great family. Uh, I, was, I was working with North Carolina Farm Bureau. I had this great insurance career. I had a 1,000 clients and pretty much, you know what I mean, it was just rocking and rolling. We were making great money, multiple six-figure income. Everything was great. And the Lord burdened my heart to begin speaking. Okay? And, 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 and through that process, he, he wanted me to write. And so I went to NC State, you know what I mean? It was, a, it was not a, 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 a liberal arts college education, right? I tell people I was in communications, which basically means I talked my way through college. But when I got through, I decided the Lord was calling me to write a book. So I ended up writing this book and going on this miraculous journey of, of, of feeling the Lord calling me to do this right here. No formal training, not an ordained pastor, none of those things, just listening to the Lord and following where he led. And over the course of the last 10 years, I have had the opportunity to speak to thousands, if not more, tens of thousands of people um, in this journey of uncovering my passion and my gift to speak. But what I will tell you is, along the way, the Lord asked me to lay some things down. So, cold turkey with five kids at home, I walked away from a six-figure income to go full-time into ministry. And that was back in 2018. And I can tell you that we've lived through six very painful, difficult, frustrating years. I thought, hey, Matt is all in. He left his job to jump in and preach. We're going to have him come speak at our church. Didn't happen. In fact, the other thing happened. A lot of churches said, man, you need to go start your own thing, which is a really nice church way of saying you're not welcome here. 
And I'll be honest, I was mad. I was fiery. And I was like, well, you just don't get it. And, I mean, yeah, and, and, and so when you're wrestling with your purpose and you got to wrestle with it, I promise you, you're going to experience this pain. And I have lived it and I have lived it and I have lived it. I have lived this wrestling with this purpose. But you know what's beautiful? Churches wouldn't have me to speak, but guess who I got a phone call from? The local nursing home. Hey, Matt, would you come and lead a service for our residents? You see, I want to be on big stages and in arenas or whatever. And God puts me in front of 10 or so people who are struggling with their cognitive abilities. And that's who he says, can you serve me and my kingdom by preaching here as you would if you were preaching there? And so humbly, every Monday, I go into this nursing home, and I sit down, and I listen to the same stories over and over and over, and I love on mostly these ladies now, and we talk about the kingdom of God. And it's been so empowering for me because there were about four or five men that joined us when we first started about four years ago, and guess what? I've watched all of them pass away. And this crowd of so 20 uh, ladies and men that, we, that I had the opportunity to minister to each and every week, I watch them slowly die off. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, God, what are you saying to me in the midst of this? What are you doing in the midst of this? This is not easy. This is very challenging. And he's like, I'm teaching you about purpose. There was a, a beautiful lady named Mrs. King And I came into the nursing home one day, and they said, Matt, Miss King has passed away. I said, okay. And they said, the family would like to see you. I said, me? I'm just the traveling guy that comes in and prays. Yeah, yeah, the family would like to see you. I go to the room, and and the son is in the room, and and a lady comes to the door, and she said, I'm sorry, the family's not seeing visitors. And I said, oh, I'm so, so sorry. She goes, wait, are you Matt? I said, yeah, I'm Matt. She says, oh, my gosh, come in. And I walk in, and Miss King was still in the bed with her son by the bedside. And if you've never been in end-of-life situations, I mean, it's, it's very emotionally intense, right? And I'm watching this situation. The son's sitting there looking down at his, his, his mother, who's deceased. And he said, Matt, I know we've never met. But my mom called me two days ago before she died, and she said she wanted me to tell you something. Almost as if she knew she was going to pass. And I'm in the middle of wrestling with my own calling and my own purpose, not feeling like I fit in. The only place that God has opened the door for me to speak is this nursing home. I'm not getting jobs over here. I'm not making money. I walked away. I'm watching my savings dwindling. My wife and I are looking at how are we going to continue to provide. I've got all of this different stuff in the atmosphere around me. And here I am in the room with this man and his mother, and he said she had a word for you. He said, I've been a Presbyterian minister for 40 years, and I've never been able to reach my mother the way that the Lord used you to reach her. You reinvigorated her heart for the Lord. She had given up on God in a way because she had given up on the church. He said, she wanted me to tell you, do not stop doing what you're doing. The beauty of the Lord is when we are faithful enough to let go of everything that we value so that he can give us that, is, that of which is great value. This is the concept of the pearl of great price. And one of the things I want to tell you guys in in sharing that testimony, and listen, that's happened multiple times with a lot of different of these uh, these people that I get to walk with at this nursing home. And the Lord's just sitting there going, son, well done. You don't need the praise of the stage. And, And the truth is, is God had to work that out of me. Because God said, I don't need your ego 
I just need you. And so walking through that pain, watching him some, birth something beautiful, go to the next slide. You know, the, the thing that I would tell you in my own journey is I was conditioned when I was living out searching for my purpose. It made me a very unhappy person. I was mad that other people didn't get it. I was frustrated that it wasn't happening fast enough. And when you are faithful enough and courageous enough to live out your purpose, you're going to see everything in the world come up against you. And I'm telling you, if you could go back to that, that, you just fine? The fruit that, if the fruit of the Spirit is not present in your journey, you're missing the boat. You see, you got to live out your purpose with love. You got to live out your purpose with joy. Patience, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. You see, a lot of people have this purpose and they're just going to go blast it on the internet and this is what I'm doing or whatever. And God said, You have no self control. I haven't asked you to do that. I haven't given you the authority to speak on stages that you think you're ready to speak on. You have to be faithful with what he's given you before he's willing to give you more. And as you become trustworthy to him, he begins to entrust you with more. This is the process. This is the gospel. This is how it's lived out. This is Jesus learning obedience through suffering, and we don't get a hall pass. Last point on this slide. <clears throat> here's, the, here's the kicker, right? If I told you that under the third tree out there by the bus line pickup, there was a billion dollars buried in the ground. But that tree cost you your net worth. Unless we have a billionaire in the audience, I think most of you would probably sell everything you had and go buy that thing out there, that tree. This is the parable, right? The hidden treasure in a field, the pearl of great price. He sells everything to buy it. The problem for us is we don't believe it's that valuable. You see, I, I know this thing. I, I've worked with so many people who said, man, I would love to build things with my hands. Or I would love to you know, start a school for kids. Or I would love to whatever, all these different things. But I just can't do that because... It doesn't make any money or whatever. What they're basically saying is my money is more valuable than this purpose God has called me to. This is the rich young ruler encounter, right? Where Jesus says, sell everything and follow me. And it says he leaves, he leaves saddened. Now, that's not the case for everybody. He's not, he's not asking us to all and become destitute to go. But the point is, is in your heart, you have to let go of everything that you value because you value his purpose for your life more. Going back to my wife and I riding in the car last night, one of the questions was, what is your greatest nightmare? My first answer was being dropped off in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night. That would be terrifying to me. I've watched Jaws too much as a kid. I'm just not having it, right? Number two was somebody asking me to volunteer in children's ministry. And listen, I promise you, I love your kids, but I got five of my own, and that is not my gift set, okay? Okay. And then I said, but honestly, babe, you know what my real nightmare is? My real nightmare and why I go back to the story about the nursing home is I don't want to be like one of those folks and have the thought that I died without living out my purpose. I don't want to have held anything back. I'm going to go and buy the field. I'm going to go and buy the pearl of great price. So we'll go to the last slide here as we kind of wrap this up. The greatest secret that most people don't realize, this is really, really profound. When we read this passage of scripture, when we read this parable, I think a lot of times we only read this parable from the perspective that we are the man who finds the treasure, that we are the merchant who is searching for the pearl. And God is saying, if you really want my kingdom, if you really want my purpose, then you've got to sell everything to buy it, right? That's how we read this. That's how I've been teaching 
teaching this. The problem is you can't do that until you know what I'm getting ready to tell you. The truth of the gospel is you are the pearl that God paid everything for. You are the treasure in the field that he spilled his own son's blood to buy. Our theology of God has been so damaged over the last generation because we feel like God's up there and we just hadn't gotten it right. And if we'll get it right, then he'll come in and love us. And he's going, no, you don't get it. I've already paid the bill. I had a good friend of mine, Carrie, one time. And we were talking through my whole journey of purpose and whatever. And, and Carrie said, the, word ga- the Lord gave her a word for me. And, and she said, and it stuck with me for so long. She said, Matt, God pays for what he orders. Whew. As they say down east, that's stronger than goat's breath. God pays for what he ordered. You think God ordered a purpose in your life and he's incapable of funding it? Y'all, I I told them I was going to sit in this chair and I'm getting real eager to want to jump up and run around on the stage. Because that that is some truth that we have to grab hold of. When you realize that you're the pearl, he's already bought you. He's already paid for you. You don't have to do anything. You just have to step into it. It's a different mindset. And so we have to break free of this imprisonment that religion has placed on us, that we have to be behaved and put together and figure it out and have a business plan. You know what the business plan is? Do what God tells you to do. That's the business plan. And y'all, my life is living proof of this. I worked for 10 years to build an insurance agency with Farm Bureau. God said, step away from it. I stepped away from it, left it go cold turkey. He said, build this ministry. I built this ministry for six years. And then he said, step away from it. I spent 16 years of my life building things that I had no ownership in, that I had no uh, fruit to show in a worldly sense. And then God said, now it's time for us to build. And in the last year, the Lord has raised up an insurance agency that I run and this ministry redefined that I get to run and he says good job my faithful servant you were able to lay those things down so now I can trust you with giving you this new place in your life and I'll tell you 42 restarting pretty much it's it's zero when I was doing what I was doing at 26 but you know what every lesson that I learned along the way was so invaluable to allow me to now stand up and do the thing that I do and not be attached to an outcome Because it's what God has called me to do. And so I'm not saying as if I've achieved anything or I have reached some pinnacle. I'm just saying I'm a guy who has lived out through the pain and the struggle of everything that I've taught you guys today. And I want to encourage you. It begins when you start to see your identity in him different. As a son or daughter, as a pearl that he paid everything for. And when you believe that and when you receive that and when you begin living from that, now you actually have the courage to go after that thing he's already put inside of you. And this is the kingdom. Because we need you, and we need you, and we need you, and we need you. One body, many parts. That's how the kingdom works. And so I just want to encourage you all with this today. And as we wrap up here, of course, you know God paid the price. And the last thing I will say is it's time. I told my friend the other day, it's time for the church to start being the church. The world needs to see God's people living this out. And that's the most empowering way that you can share Christ with somebody. God's not concerned about your theology. He's not concerned with how many boxes you've checked. He's just asking, do you know that you're a pearl? 
And are you willing to lay down everything to go after the pearl that I've placed inside of you? Let us pray. Father God, thank you for oh, just your grace, Lord, with me and my energy and my testimony. And I pray that it would be nothing more than just a testimony to you, to your goodness, Lord, to how much you love us and how much you have called us and how much you are just waiting on us to begin to believe. Father, I just I, I pray that seeds sown today would be sown in, in fruitful soil and that they would yield 30, 60, 100 fold return. I pray that the bondage and chains of spiritual religion would be broken off. I pray that the bondage and imprisonment of cultural ideology would be broken off. I pray that people would wake up today and recognize that whatever cell they feel like they are in, the door has already been pushed ajar and you are calling them to step out in faith. That we would be a people who get out of the boats in our life and walk to you through the impossible, Father, and that is the waves in the world around us. God, give us great joy to be a people who carry your light into this world like it's never been seen before. And give us the courage to live out your kingdom to the glory of our King, Jesus, through the great power of his Holy Spirit. We ask all of this in his mighty and wonderful name. Amen. Thank you.